Um, yesterday, we, we had a fascinating keynote uh, from uh, General Tuil. Today, uh, we have a keynote from our industry representative. And there's some history associated with this as well. Uh, somebody was commenting, they can tell I'm getting older because I continue to reminisce. Uh, this, is, this is sort of part of that. Uh, this is also the 25th anniversary uh, of the first release of the public version of Tripwire. Uh, it was released to the general public on November 2nd of uh, 1992. And how many of you know the significance of November 2nd? Really? Wow. Okay. Well, that was the anniversary of the Morris Internet worm. Uh, but that was also the day that Gene Kim and I decided to release the uh, first public version of Tripwire. Uh, 25 years ago this year, and 20 years ago, um, Gene Kim, Wyatt Starnes, uh, myself, and a few others came up with the idea for Tripwire the Company. And in 20 years, it has grown to be one of the uh, premier security companies uh, in business today. Going back about those 20 years, there was a student at Carnegie Mellon who was working in computing and was exploring uh, hacking systems and looking into some of what was available and got really involved with the community doing that to the point where he became a co-editor of uh, one of the underground magazines, Frack. Uh, when Chris Klaus uh, started ISS, uh, basically he built a scanner, he was inspired by what we had done with cops and then built a company around it. He reached out to some of his friends to help build the company out and one of the first people he reached out to was his friend, uh, David Meltzer. David joined Tripwire, uh, became one of the first engineers, worked for a while, went off, started his own company, and then through a series of acquisitions, found himself back at Tripwire, where he is now the CTO. He has a distinguished career working at ISS, uh, as I said, starting uh, internet companies, working as an engineer uh, uh, in the security space, and now as CTO of Tripwire is responsible for a number of issues with uh, technology vision and speaking to the public, including us here today. Please welcome David Meltzer. Okay, Can, is the mic on? Excellent. We can see the projector. All right, we're ready to go. So this is actually a little awkward because of what Spaff just said. Um, I didn't realize that there was someone from Syracuse University here because I grew up in Syracuse and as a high school student, one of the first things that I got interested in doing was getting access to uh, SunOS systems. Uh, and if you're in high school in the early 90s, late 80s, um, you couldn't go to your high school lab. You couldn't find a Sun system anywhere. And so the only way that I found to get one was to go break into the Syracuse University computers. So I uh, apologize for that. Uh, the statute of limitations has long since expired, plus I was a minor. So it's probably okay at this point in time. I did want to kind of get a level set here of the audience. We have, uh, obviously, um, the founders of Tripwire are here and uh, a lot of students. How many of you have actually used the open source Tripwire product before? And how many used it in the 90s at some point? Okay, so we got the, we got the old school security people here. And the transition that I'll talk about is from what the open source roots were through to our commercial product and how it turned into a company. How many of you have ever used the commercial version of Tripwire? So we, we, we got a couple of people, but not very many. Um, I'm also going to talk about how Tripwire has evolved and actually has consumed some other areas of security in our product line as well. Uh, and some of those include what was being done at Purdue with Dan Farmer and COPS. How many of you ever used COPS? And then Dan, after COPS, came out with Satan, um, which ended up competing with what internet security systems did in a commercial product with what was called Internet Scanner at the time. How many of you ever used Satan? Well, we got a few. And uh, in Internet Scanner uh, in the 90s, we got a couple as well. So th those are kind of the, you know, the old days. And 
as the CTO of Tripwire, I have some good special opportunities. Um, one of the special opportunities I have is I'm the number one most frequent flyer amongst our 500 or so employees at Tripwire. Um, that's not a good thing. Um, that's not the benefit, but where I go is often the benefit. Uh, and where I go is I go to many of our customers who are large organizations, large enterprises, governments, um, states, um, large companies, and I talk to security administrators, directors of security operations, chief information security officers, and I get to have conversations with them about how are they thinking about their security programs today? What are the things that they're doing to secure their environments? Uh, and then I d often dig into the things that we do at Tripwire, like file integrity monitoring and vulnerability management, and we really dig into the details. Uh, and sometimes I spend days with these customers saying, how are you implementing and using these security controls? So I've been able to get a really good perspective amongst especially large organizations on how they're building out, evolving their security programs, and particularly the kinds of things that we do at Tripwire. And so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a flavor of what that looks like today. Um, one of the other special opportunities I get is to speak at uh, industry events, sometimes because they like me, sometimes it's just because of my position as CTO of Tripwire. Um, this is a great opportunity. When, when I got the invitation to speak here, I jumped on it instantly because I understand the history uh, of where Tripwire came from and its roots here at Purdue. And so one of the things that I really want to try and accomplish in this hour is to give SPAF and to give the Purdue community an update of where did this open source tool that got built 25 years ago turn into uh, over the period of many decades and how are people using it and how has it really become a pillar of the security ecosystem today. And so hopefully I, I give you that flavor. Um, I also want to give you an update of what is the state of the commercial security market today. So I'll share you some statistics about um, you know, what the commercial world looks like. I'll try and give you some insight as to how people think about the commercial security industry and how large organizations are thinking about security. Uh, I'm, not, uh, you know, I'm not an ac academic. Uh, I did eventually graduate from Carnegie Mellon. It took me eight years to do it. Um, and so that's how not academic oriented I am. Um, but uh, in that middle of that, I did start some companies. So I do have a very good view of how security companies get started and grow and evolve and ultimately become mature organizations. Uh, I also want to share with you today a little bit about what isn't working in security. Um, because if you look at the news, if you look at the level of breaches, if you look at what's happening, you would have to in some way look back at these last 25 years and say um, what we're doing isn't working. And so I think we need to take a look at that and say, well, why isn't it working? What's not working? And how can we get better? Now, obviously in security, you know, the idea that security, and this is what people were thinking 20 years ago, is if, it, if I just had that right new tool, then I could secure my organization. So it's just, I just don't have that tool yet. It, I got to get that next new thing. And I think we've all realized that that's never the reality. It's really about managing risk. It's about lowering your risk and trying to find that right balance of, investment in actually keeping your systems as secure as they need to be um, and finding those right barriers and borders to put around them. So security has definitely evolved. How people think about security has evolved. I'll try and share some of that. And then I'll finish up by telling you a few opportunities that I see where we get to do a little bit of a do-over. Um, when we talk about security and cybersecurity, for the most part, people are talking about IT security. Um, but there are some new opportunities we're going to have to do this again. Um, and I'm seeing it happen in multiple different areas today. And I think if we can learn from the last 25 years of what we got right and didn't get right in IT security, we might be able to get a little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit more secure when we do this again in some of these new areas. So with that, let me jump into a little bit of the transformation of Tripwire over the last 25 years. This is the... Uh, Coast, uh, the paper that came from Gene Kim, who is the founder of Tripwire along with SPAF uh, from uh, 1993, and talked about the open source roots of Tripwire and what it did, and actually went back and read this paper this week uh, just to get a good uh, baseline of what did it do back then. Um, and what I was able to pull out of the Tripwire archives, there are some people at Tripwire who've been there for almost 20 years, and I said, do you have any really old presentations? And they sent me the business plan presentation when they were pitching Tripwire to investors and analysts back in 1998. You can tell it's from 1998 because of the triangles 
and the uh, color palette. Uh, I, I, I don't think that even exists in PowerPoint anymore. Um, but Tripwire in 1998 was really pitched as file integrity assessment or file integrity monitoring. And so this terminology that was created and generally accepted in security today, people would call it FIM, file integrity monitoring. It started as this file integrity assessment. It was, you know, came out in 1992, recommended by CERT, got a lot of downloads. I think I first downloaded Tripwire around 1994 probably um, because I knew that if I was going to go break into systems, I better figure out how they were going to detect me breaking into systems. Uh, and actually, I gave a talk back in 1996, um, 96, 97, and it was one of the first talks I ever gave. I was, uh, I was students, I was a security researcher at ISS at the time, and the talk was how to evade detection by tripwire, um, which I thought was, you know, I I'd figured out some of the things. I got to talk to staff a little bit about it yesterday. Um, but it was really this idea of host-based intrusion detection if someone makes a change to your system, that's probably where it went from the state of being in the secure state to someone did something bad to it. And if we could detect those changes, then we would be in a much better position to identify when people were breaking into the systems and doing things like adding users or installing root kits or making malicious changes to the server. Uh, and often people were deploying this to kind of the couple of servers that they had around their organization. The idea of monitoring for file change is something that has evolved into what you would call today probably more anomalous um, intrusion detection type capability. Back in the mid-90s when we talked about the idea of security in this area, uh, at ISS we used to draw a really simple diagram like a vertical line, a horizontal line, and we said on the one hand of security there's trying to identify where the risks are. Um, and you could do that at a host level or a network level. Host level would be things like what COPS did. The network level would be what things like state and an internet scanner did. And then you could try and find people actually trying to break into systems. And this is, was intrusion detection. And the idea of intrusion detection went back to um, you know, US Air Force in like 80. Um, but the idea of doing it at a network level was a little bit later on. And you could do intrusion detection at a system level, which was like what Tripwire did. Or you could do it at a network level. That was the software uh, that I built at ISS called Real Secure, which was a network IDS. And there were various other network IDSs that had come out around uh, late 80s and the, in the, into the 90s. But it started in the 90s, it started to get commercial acceptance. And people started to buy these products um, from companies like ISS and Tripwire. And there were other companies like the Wheel Group and Accent who were around back in that period of time. So we're looking for files. We're looking for anomalies in the files. Um, and that was basically the idea. So let me fast forward now about um, 25 years and talk about why are people using file integrity monitoring today. Uh, and, and really there's four reasons. And you can see how it's kind of evolved from we want to just look for file changes because that means something's bad happened. Well, there's really the four reasons is first, um, the primary reason people are deploying file integrity monitoring uh, is not to look for bad people doing bad things anymore. Um, the number one reason is they're looking for good people making unauthorized changes to systems. Uh, and it turns out that this is a really critical part of reducing the attack surface of your servers is to know is someone taking a system that was in a well-known secure configured state and they're making changes they shouldn't make to it. And generally this is system administrators who are going outside of an established change control process uh, and they're reconfiguring the system on the fly. And this happens all the time, every day, uh, across any large organization. So if you can keep your system in a secure state, then you'll have a better chance of preventing people from being able to break into it. So it turns from a reactive type of control, where we're looking for attackers trying to do bad things, into a more proactive type of control, where we're trying to prevent people from getting the system into a state where it could be broken into. Uh, the second use case is really the same thing as it was the original idea of Tripwire was, which is identifying someone maliciously doing something to the system. Now, how people will do malicious things to systems has changed over time, and so the way that you need to detect those things has also changed. But identifying malicious change is one of those key use cases. The third thing that we often see is actually sometimes people use this file integrity monitoring type of control not for security at all they bake it into what they would call their IT operations process, which is they have something where if someone wants to make a change to a system, they have to open a tr trouble ticket. 
If you go to a large company, those tickets go to a change control board. The change control board reviews the change, approves the change. The change then gets pushed out into production. And people use Tripwire across many large companies to be the system that tells you what actually happened to the server. So we have this whole process that tells you what should happen to the server. Um, but then you have this gap where nobody knows if they actually implemented what they said they were going to do. And so people use Tripwire for that detective control capability. And then the fourth reason, which actually is, I would characterize it as people smarter than me said you should use Tripwire, um, which is every compliance regulation, every security standard that has been written in the last decade says you need to be doing something about monitoring your critical systems for their integrity. Um, and you know, this comes back to 25 years ago, you know, SPAF and Gene wrote a paper around why it was so important to monitor servers and systems for integrity and the value of that monitoring. And eventually people who were writing standards said they're right. We probably should tell people that this is a really important thing to do. Uh, and they did. Um, and this is primarily the reason why today file integrity monitoring is considered a what we would call a foundational security control, which is no matter who's trying to attack you, uh, no matter what organization, what your adversary is, whether you're worried about cybercrime syndicates, whether you're worried about nation state actors or hacktivists, no matter what you care about, um, you need to do the basics of security right to have an effective security program. And so whether you're looking at things like the Center for Internet Security's critical security controls, or the NIST cybersecurity framework, the PCI standards, the ISO standards, all of these standards are greatly overlapping. They 90% all say the same thing. And every single one of them says, you need to do integrity monitoring on your critical systems if you want to have an effective security program. Uh, and that really has been what has driven the success of Tripwire as a company for many decades, which is we started with this idea of integrity monitoring would be an, an important security control. It got baked into all of these standards and regulations to say, yes, we all believe this is a very critical security control. And now any large organization that wants to build out a security program, generally what they're doing is, um, well, what they often do is they have a CISO or they have some smart security people who say, I, I know how I want to implement this security program. Now, if they're smart, generally what they're going to do is say, I'm not going to try and create this from scratch. I'm going to use some accepted standards that are already out there, and I'm going to evaluate the current state of my security program against that, and then we're going to figure out where can we evolve and improve our program. And so no matter which they choose to base their security programs on, and we're increasingly seeing adoption uh, in the commercial space around like the NIST cybersecurity framework, but a lot of companies are using the CIS critical security controls as well. We're seeing people that decide they're going to adopt these kind of standards. Now back in 1997, when Tripwire got started, there were, um, and I don't have a good number, um, but there were a handful, maybe dozens of security companies out there, um, most of them pretty small. Tripwire was in the market. They were ironically competing uh, at that point against internet security systems, which is where I worked. And at that point in time, uh, ISS was really the leader around this internet scanning and uh, vulnerability assessment, intrusion detection side. There was this other company, Accent, that was pretty good sized as well. Um, and Tripwire was using in their brochure, uh, in their marketing materials to uh, their investors, look how successful ISS could be. Uh, and now here I am, you know, 20 years later, I'm back at Tripwire from where I was at ISS at the time. So a little bit of the corporate history of how Tripwire has, has now evolved over those many years. Uh, founded in 97, released the Tripwire Enterprise product, which was our multi-server uh, managed uh, system in 2005. The company made a couple of acquisitions. That's actually how I ended up at uh, Tripwire. Uh, I started a company back in 2002. It got acquired in 2007 by another company, uh, N-Circle, where I became the CTO. And then that company got acquired by Tripwire back in 2013. So I've been at Tripwire since 2013. I was actually competing against Tripwire before that in the market for some part of the last uh, 15 years before that. Um, and then Tripwire, uh, from a corporate entity perspective, got acquired by a private equity firm, uh, and then subsequently got acquired by a larger organization called Belden uh, about uh, two and a half years ago. So Tripwire is run as an independent business within Belden, which is a larger company. 
thought I'd just give you a little bit of color of who owns Tripwire today. Uh, Belden, publicly traded company, it's about 100 years old company, um, has headquarters in St. Louis, Missouri, um, offices in Indianapolis as well as Richmond, uh, as well as a number of places around the world. Uh, Tripwire is headquarters in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm based in Atlanta, uh, which is uh, coming out of the ISS roots when I moved down there to go work for my friend back in the 90s. Um, Belden makes uh, Ethernet cable. Uh, 100 years ago, they were making copper wire. Uh, one of their customers was Thomas Edison. And they moved from making wire to cable to ultimately making networking equipment for industrial markets. Uh, and so the first Ethernet cable ever made in the world came from Belden. Uh, the first cable TV transmission came from Belden equipment. The first Ethernet switch on a manufacturing floor came from Belden. Uh, and so this is a company that has seen this transformation from proprietary systems to standard IP-based systems, not for a couple of years, but over a period of many decades, uh, and has recognized the value and the importance of security as industries make this transformation to IP. Uh, and they saw this transformation happening, not on the IT side, but within the industrial markets, within the broadcast markets, and wanted to find a company that could help them with their customers making that transformation. So I'll talk more about how that applies to Tripwire uh, as we go through it. Today, Tripwire, uh, half of the Fortune 500 are Tripwire's customers um, across a wide segment. Um, I did some research around the biggest cybersecurity companies in the world. Uh, and by two financial metrics, uh, one earnings or EBITDA, uh, I couldn't find 20 companies in the world in cybersecurity um, that have as much EBITDA as Tripwire, and I couldn't find 40 companies in the world that have as much revenue as Tripwire today. So it really is one of the largest premier cybersecurity companies in the world, uh, and it has evolved itself over time. Um, which you know, is something that, uh, coming from its open source roots, I think everyone who was involved in it 20, 25 years ago should be very proud of. As we talk about Tripwire today, we are the leader in policy and compliance. So we serve three different customers uh, within large enterprises, security teams, operations teams, and compliance teams. For security teams, we detect changes that are happening in, in their organization on their critical systems, and we identify when those changes create new risks to the organization. For compliance teams, we help automate and reduce the burden of complying with standards like PCI or HIPAA or Sarbanes-Oxley uh, and things like that, NERC regulation in the utility market, because we can provide many of those detective controls and then provide all the reporting and auditing that's needed for that. And then with the operations team, we help validate what changes are happening for the organization. So now let me talk a little bit about how Tripwire has changed over these many years. Um, Tripwire. 20 years ago was file integrity monitoring. Over the years, we've added additional capability around security configuration management, vulnerability management, and log management. Uh, so we have a broader product suite. And what file integrity monitoring is has really evolved over these many years as well. So slide from 1998, how Tripwire is actually being used by real customers. Um, it was, Tripwire was running on all 10 servers that the company had. Uh, and this was probably a decent sized company at the time. Three of these machines were compromised and we were able to detect those compromised systems through seeing the files that changed on the system. So that was often the scale that we were dealing with at Tripwire back in the late 90s. Today, the scale of where our customers are using our products is orders and orders of magnitude higher. So we have retailers that use our product on 285,000 assets. Um, we have uh, a government agency that's using our product on 850,000 assets. Um, we have insurance companies using it on 45,000 assets. And just kind of give you a sampling of the kind of problem that you're trying to solve when you're talking about organizations that are trying to find change uh, and identify important security issues that are happening. When I'm looking at it for tens and hundreds of thousands of assets versus I'm looking at it on 10 systems is a very different kind of problem. Um, because very quickly we've moved from this issue of we had too little visibility into what was happening. Before anyone had open source tripwire, you would probably manually go do you know, an LS or a find. You do something on your Unix system to just try and figure out did anything change. 
So we, the first, first versions of Tripwire were really good at giving you that visibility. So now I knew something changed. But for a large organization, knowing something changed is no longer the issue. Now the problem people have is, I have, say, 50,000 servers, and there were 200 changes that happened today on each one of those servers at a file level. And so I'm dealing with, there's a million changes that I have a day, and now I'm trying to pick out, did one of those changes actually happen to be malicious? Did one of those changes happen to be the unauthorized change that shouldn't have happened in the system? Did one of those changes create a new risk to the organization? And so it turned from a visibility issue of trying to collect the data to an analytics issue of trying to sort through all of this data and figure out what's really important. And that's really one of the things that has evolved for FIM over the course of many years. Uh, one of the things that uh, has really changed for the FIM market is this idea of dynamic reconciliation, which is not every change that happens on a system is something that actually you want to have someone human pay attention to. Um, in fact, almost every change that happens to a system, it turns out, is perfectly normal, acceptable, business as usual. But unless you can filter down and pick out the one change that isn't that, you have a very difficult time getting value out of it. In the original Tripwire, you would do that generally by configuring what files you wanted to monitor. So you're going to want to monitor your system binaries and your user files and your password file. Um, but over time, what th that has changed into is, well, your binaries change every time you do a patch update. So what you really want to know is, did the binaries change in the way that my Unix provider shipped out the files to? So can I match up the change to what was supposed to happen if I did a patch update? Or did someone insert a binary into that system that was not supposed to be there? And so all this idea of dynamic reconciliation is we need to do a lot of things in FIM to be able to figure out was it something that was authorized, unauthorized, malicious, or benign when it was happening. Uh, and we've done a lot of work at that around Tripwire. Another thing that changed was the visualization. So here's uh, uh, output from uh, a circa 19, mid-90s output of Tripwire detecting that a file changed on the system. Uh, and uh, here's something from our current reporting platform uh, that shows the, again, versus, you can still dig down and see that single file change and what changed on it, but very often people start with this level of, okay, how many thousands of changes were happening across my systems at time, and can I start to pick out what was the anomalous changes across that broad set of information? Another thing that changed is um, the idea of files being the part that we want to focus on for integrity has drastically altered for every large organization. So we often still call it file integrity monitoring, but when we talk about that, it's really monitoring all of the configuration attributes of a system. So your database servers, your active directory servers, your firewalls, your router switches, systems that are running in the cloud, application information that's running. So the idea that it's just files uh, is something that's very much evolved over time, and Stripwire has advanced quite a lot in monitoring a broad set of different kinds of systems. So a little bit of what's changed with Tripwire. Now let me tell you what's changed from having a couple dozen security companies to what security looks like uh, from a commercial security market perspective in 2017. If you're a large organization and you want to look at what are the different security products I need to buy and implement to have a secure organization, there are about 60 different categories of security products out there I need to deal with. So you go in and you want to talk to a chief information security officer about their security program. They probably have at least 60 different products. Um, and there are products that cover more than one of these areas. Um, and there are vendors that cover more than one of these areas. But it's very typical to find large organizations that have 10, 20, 50, 80 different security companies that they're buying products from at any given point in time. I did an analysis um, because one of the things I do as CTO uh, is uh, business development and corporate development for the company of how many security companies are out there. Uh, and I actually made a spreadsheet and got some links and categorized them. It was a big endeavor. Uh, and I came up with 1,641 security companies. Um, and I'm pretty confident I didn't capture all of them. Um, so the number is definitely higher than that. There's at least 1,641 security companies out there. Um, I did some analysis of the data that I collected when I did this. Um, and this is not categories. This is have the word in their name. 
So there are 51 something network or network something companies out there and 34 threat something companies out there, uh, 33 cloud something, seven fire somethings. Uh, there, was a, there was a couple of years where fire was a really popular word. Uh, colors are also really popular in security company names and red is the most popular color if you wanted to start a security company. Blue next, black is a little one. There's only one orange security company out there. So I kind of went through all this. I said, okay, if you want to build a new security company, yeah, I saw some good uh, whiteboard posters uh, yesterday. Uh, you want to call it like Red Cloud Threat Network. That's a perfect name for your security company. <laughs> It'll be the most, people will be like, I think I've heard of you guys. Now, if you go back to those categories and look at how many different security companies are in each one of these categories, there's 117 startups that are focused around mobile security today. There's 112 security companies focused on encryption. There are 72 focused around the area of threat intelligence. So the amount of companies that are out there in very early stage, more than 90% of these 1,600 companies are losing money, uh, and the great majority are in probably a stage where they've been venture funded, they've gotten a handful of customers, typical company I talk to at the startup stage, raised a couple million dollars, handful of customers, maybe doing a million or two million in revenue, um, and they need to find some way to pivot into turning into a more mature organization over the next couple years, or hopefully get acquired by someone else so they don't have to. Um, and for a large organization who's now buying security products, this is a very difficult ecosystem to navigate through because the number of companies that are calling any large organization on a daily basis is staggering. And the number of those companies out there that are gonna be in the same business selling the same products 10 years from now is a very small minority. And so this makes a really difficult challenge because it's a really moving target of acquiring security products. So if you look at Tripwire, um, we kind of put ourselves into this bucket. Um, there's a category of security that's evolved to be called security and vulnerability management. Um, Sub-segments of that include an area called policy compliance and then another one called device vulnerability assessment. So when we talk about where does file integrity monitoring now fit today amongst the 60 categories of security that analysts like Gartner and IDC would place things into, IDC would say FIM is part of the policy compliance market. Uh, and Tripwire is now one of the leaders in the overall SVM and particularly that policy compliance market that we play in. So hopefully giving you a little bit of flavor for how crowded the overall security industry is and how unique it is to have created something here 25 years ago that has become one of those top 20 of thousands of companies uh, that have started since then and have not reached that level of success scale or particularly a long-term sustainable profitable business, um, which is what Tripwire is today and which very few companies in the security world actually are. So let me now talk about what's happening today in security that's actually gonna transform what Tripwire is for the next five and 10 years. Because what we're doing today is not going to keep working uh, if we don't continue to evolve as a company. We don't continue to evolve what integrity monitoring means to organizations uh, and the kind of things that we need to be able to do to help secure those environments. So, First thing I want to talk about, and this is going to be, you know, a motherhood and apple pie to everyone here, explosive growth in the number of assets that are IP connected out there in the world. So back in the 90s, we were talking about there's a couple of million devices that are IP connected. Um, and that evolved to half a billion, and that's now going to be 50 billion in a couple of years. And this goes to this scale problem that people are facing all over the security world. And you talk to large organizations, it's not just their IT servers, but now I have everything from smart lights that are getting connected, the Internet of Things kind of devices, the smart, um, you know, smart homes are getting connected. All of these things are creating new connectivity, new kinds of risks, and is going to require a different kind of thinking around security challenges. Um, everyone knows security breaches are continuing to soar. We're not going to spend much time on that. The skills gap is something for us as a industry is very concerning to how it's going to impact um, how our products need to work, how we offer our products and services to our customers, and what this is going to mean for security going forward. Um, if you're a student and you're in the security area today, um, you will have no problem at all finding a job for many years to come. So you chose a good, uh, chose a good industry to get into. Um, but from a product perspective, 
what, what I often see when I look at very early stage prototypes or people come up with new ideas for security products or a new idea for a security concept, if you're creating something that you're going to incrementally improve the security for a large organization, but it's going to require any amount of effort for them to deploy, install, operate, and manage that new security solution, you haven't helped them at all. Um, you theoretically believe you created something that has helped improve the security or could improve the security of a company, but security organizations, they can't find people to hire to operate your product. Um, they don't have enough people to operate the products they have, and what they generally are trying to accomplish today is to consolidate down to fewer products that have lower operational cost so that I can more effectively manage the increasing scale of the number of systems I need to secure. So when you think about innovation and what are the kind of problems that you could solve in security today that would be really interesting to large companies, it's things that would incrementally improve security, but it actually has to reduce how much time they have to spend. Uh, it actually has to be more automated. It has to eliminate manual process they have to go through today. And in many ways, this is the challenge of file integrity monitoring for large organizations, which is things that produce data are challenging for companies because now I need someone to look at the data. And so all of our focus at Tripwire because of this skills gap is how can we automate our products? How can we reduce how much time it takes to operate the product? How can we make it easier for someone to deploy, operate, and manage these kind of solutions? And that's what companies across the security industry are trying to accomplish today. Uh, and so it's not that we don't need more ways to secure organizations and we need new security ideas and innovation, um, but that's the mindset you find in many large companies. The cloud. Uh, I'm sure everyone is, you know, everyone's very familiar with the transformation to the cloud that's happening. 20% of the compute power in the world today is already in the cloud, uh, and it's growing 50% over the next 10 years. So for a large enterprise, the future for the next five to 10 years is what I would characterize as a hybrid organization. And when I say hybrid, it means if you're a large company, you're gonna have a combination of physical servers, virtualization, private cloud, and public cloud environments you have to secure. And so the cloud hasn't actually made the challenge of securing that environment any easier. It's just given me one more thing to secure because although companies are migrating applications into the cloud, it's gonna be for most companies many, many years before they actually get rid of all of their physical servers and virtualization that already exists. And so they are looking for solutions that can cover this broad set of private and public cloud infrastructure they have. And the idea of FIM has to be reinvented for this architecture as well. If people take a Linux server, and it used to be 20 years ago it was a physical server running on some you know, direct CPU, and then it you know, ran on virtualization, now it's running on Zen or it's running on VMware, and then they took it and they moved it to Amazon or Azure and they put it in EC2 and now it's a Linux system. That's a pretty easy thing to secure because it's basically the same thing as it used to be, it's just running somewhere else. That's easy. What becomes really difficult is when people are adopting cloud technology, they're not just doing it at that infrastructure layer, they're writing applications in an entirely new way. So instead of having a Linux system, I'm writing C code on and compiling and I'm executing. Um, now I'm writing it in an Amazon environment, I'm using S3 object storage to store all of my files. I'm using maybe Redshift as a database to store uh, you know, relational data into. I'm using their Lambda service to actually do compute power. Um, and so now I take the idea of, okay, well I wanna do integrity monitoring on the files. And the traditional way Tripwire would work would say, okay, just tell me where the Linux system is and I'll go put my agent on it and then we'll monitor the file system. And the conversation back from the IT team is, there is no operating system. There is no file system. So I do wanna monitor integrity, but where? And the answer to where is, it's where the data is living. It's in the S3 object storage that I wanna do integrity monitoring, but it's no longer a file system. So this is really changing how we're thinking about how will we secure the future of applications at Tripwire as well. DevOps is another thing that's really transforming uh, how IT organizations are operating today. Um, and uh, I pulled out a quote from Gene Kim, our founder, unrelated to Tripwire, 
where they call it DevOps, but it's really, it's Dev, it's Ops, it's QA, it's Test, and it's Security, uh, all in one that you're trying to, to put together. I go out and I talk to organizations about their DevOps process. Generally, what they're trying to accomplish at a high level is you know, more effective application development and rollout. But what this means in practice is very often they're using deployment tools to take a system image and instead of pushing a new image into production once and then changes happen at the production level on those systems, now what they're doing is they're going back to their development systems, making a configuration change on the development system, and then they actually delete the production system. They do a new rollout of systems from dev to test to prod, and now the new system replaces the old system. So you think about this from a traditional file integrity monitoring approach. We were sitting on this production server looking for changes to it. Well, now no changes ever happen to the production server at a configuration level. There's activity that happens. But at the configuration level, the system's static, and then what we see is the system gets destroyed a new system gets stood up, and it turns out these two systems are like one configuration item apart. So we still want to monitor this whole environment for integrity, but the idea that we could do it at a file system level on a single system is no longer applicable. We need to be monitoring the complete deployment rollout state and be able to associate this system replace that system, and this was the configuration change that happened between them. So it's really changed how we need to be thinking about integrity monitoring from a security approach. Docker, uh, Docker, and more broadly, the containerization uh, that we're seeing companies uh, adopt. Docker, uh, a year ago, uh, I go out to customers every week, talk to a lot of them. Not a single customer had ever asked me about Docker. Uh, and this year, and really for the last six, nine months, I haven't gone to a single customer of ours that doesn't ask me, what do I do about Docker? Um, it's gotten huge adoption over the last year in the IT world and it's application developers who are building these containers and these micro instances of applications and system components. And here's the challenge for you go back to traditional security controls. If you're sitting at the base operating system level and looking for change, what happens is now someone's building their application with 50 different containers that's sitting on top of your Linux operating system within their Docker environment. And you're not able to get visibility into any individual container because they're all basically hidden from the base operating system if you're only looking at base file system changes. So you need to figure out, well, how do we approach this? The idea of installing an agent on 50 containers is a very difficult challenge. The idea that as people build containers, what they often do is they'll take the elastic capacity of Docker and say, I'm going to stand up 50 identical containers to do some amount of processing right now for 30 seconds, and then I'm gonna go destroy that container. So if you were to monitor that from an integrity perspective, you would just see these containers you know, standing up and disappearing all the time all over your environment, and very rarely would anything change within them. And so we need a new model of how are we gonna monitor, assess for change within a Docker container and within containers in general so that we can maintain the integrity monitoring of those systems and do it without having to install things within the container because they're too small for that, and do things that can associate multiple containers that are really the same system with each other. And people are trying to solve this problem by doing things like integrating back to container repositories, integrating back to other systems uh, that hold the static containers versus trying to do this all on a runtime basis when the container first stands up. The original, some of the original ways people were using the open source tripwire was, I'm gonna scan for files once a day. Well, when you live in a world where virtual systems, cloud systems, and containers might only live for 30 seconds at a time, the idea that I could do a daily assessment for change is no longer really an applicable model. So already we have things that do real-time change monitoring and giving you instant visibility into what's happening, but we do really need to continue to look at how do we change our model for this. So just to finish up here, um, let me tell you a, little, a few areas where I think we've gotten it wrong. Um, Phishing is a great example. How many of you um, have to take or have taken some kind of security awareness training? All right, security awareness is a big area. In fact, there's, a lot, there's probably a lot of research that says security awareness is one of the easiest, lowest cost, best impact things you can do to improve the security of an organization. And I believe that. Um, part of security training today is often, one of the prime things they tell people, and we do it at Tripwire too, is don't open attachments from the wrong people. 
How many people have heard that before? Yep. Okay. So, so uh, I was actually in a conference in Australia, and I heard uh, a guy from the UK um, talk about this. And I thought it was a really good example. Here's my email address. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, here's the email header when I send an email. Um, and what I would like to know from the audience is how many of you could tell me whether this email header is legitimately came from that email address or not? You could, <laughs> it, would take you, it would take you a little bit of time. Most people are not capable of deciphering whether an email legitimately came from the right address that it was sent from. Um, if you dig into it a little more and you look at exactly some of these received from headers, you can get a little bit better indication. Most of you probably don't look at the email headers for every email that you receive. Um, so this is just an example of what's really like we're trying to solve the problem of phishing by telling people don't open the wrong attachments when in reality nobody is capable of making an assessment whether the attachment is from a legitimate person or not. Um, and this is an, just an example of where security, I, I feel like, is not working. Uh, antivirus, another area that security is really not working today. Uh, average antivirus product can detect within the first hour of a new uh, virus or piece of malware being released, only detects it about 30%. Within a month, it has about 93% detection. And this is a good example of why traditional antivirus tools are not effective, um, because these systems are getting morphed and they're getting new instances all the time. And for the most part, the first people that are being targeted by them, most AV products are missing. And you're really just catching it on the back end when you basically the ancillary uh, damage, the collateral damage as the virus or malware spreads to other people, not the first people it was intended for. That's generally what AV products are catching. One more example I'll give, uh, and this is, I, I would call this, this is the consumer and SMB security problem. Um, when people build uh, small business products today, um, they're generally not thinking about security very much. In fact, some of our vulnerability researchers at Tripwire actually reported vulnerabilities to one of these SMB Wi-Fi router manufacturers, and they said, we, we just sell to consumers. We don't, they don't care about security. It was like literal reaction from them. And my, my researchers were like, no, you do care. You just don't know it yet. We're going to tell you why you care. Um, but the reality is when new things come out, um, IoT devices, wearable devices, consumer things, and I'm sure many of you have consumer IoT devices that are sitting somewhere in your home or your dorm. Um, the perception is these things are built, and you can't really see the bubble here. The perception is these things are not very vulnerable because nobody's really talked about the vulnerability of them. The reality is new things that come out generally are not being built in a secure way. And that's just a general blanket statement. Things that are built for large enterprise organizations probably have the most concern about security as they're being built today. Things being built for consumers, for small businesses, people don't care about it. If we move to the end of the curve, security researchers find vulnerabilities. They release them, they publish them, it gets a lot of news. This is like Windows. Everyone knows Windows has a ton of vulnerabilities in it, right? So the perception becomes in the market that these products like Windows have a ton of vulnerabilities in them. These things are really insecure. Meanwhile, these like new things that came out that uh, nobody found any vulnerabilities in, people just assume, well, I guess these things are probably secure. Um, I guess they're secure because nobody has ever really found any problems in it before. The reality is exactly the opposite. Um, vulnerability research, in my mind, is not really working very well. Uh, and let me tell you why. When systems are being ignored by security researchers, it's actually really hard to break into those systems for most people. Um, if you had a consumer Wi-Fi router that n none of the people back at Tripwire uh, got a hold of and tried to break into, then there are no publicly available exploits for it. It's not built into Metasploit. There are no tools that allow you to hit, click a button and break into that system. And so for the most part, the security by obscurity is protecting people. When security researchers start to look into these challenges, they find vulnerabilities, they publish the vulnerabilities, they, then other people release exploits for those vulnerabilities. And what it turns into is a model where people who care about security actually end up with better security from those researchers. Because if you care about security, now you're in a state where, well, I can patch that system, I can update the firmware, I can get to the latest release, and now, the, now I'm immune from those vulnerabilities that existed. But people who were ignoring security before, now, it's super easy to break into all of those people's systems that exist there. And this is what's generally happened in the consumer and the SMB world over the last several years. 
which is there's a ton of systems out there that are now really easy to break into because security researchers spent some time showing how insecure they are, but the people running them still don't care enough to patch and update those systems. And so we've actually created an environment where we've gotten less secure in a number of areas. Um, so let me just uh, to finish up here. We're going to open it up for some questions. But uh, the last point I'll make here is IT, we spent 25 years trying to get ourselves into a more secure state. And we're continuing to do that. It's big business. It's a big industry. There is a lot of risk that still exists there. There are some areas in the world that are very early in that same cycle of what happened in IT over the last 25 years. Uh, and I call it wherever IP strikes. We've seen this pattern that has recurred where systems went from proprietary protocols that were not interconnected with each other and not connected to the internet. And they were systems that security researchers didn't pay much attention to. They didn't have access to these systems. They didn't know that these were vulnerable systems that they could spend time on. And now we've seen these industries that are now adopting standard IP, connecting these systems to corporate networks, and they're creating new levels of insecurity. We're seeing this happen in the ICS world, the industrial control world today, as vulnerabilities have crossed from proprietary protocols to standard IP protocol, that systems that were air-gapped a decade ago are now connected to the corporate networks. And we're seeing an explosion of the number of vulnerabilities that are found in these devices. And this is ultimately going to improve the security for people who are security conscious in these environments. And it's also creating a massive new amount of risk for people who don't pay attention to security. I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides in the interest of time and go right to the end here, which is, let me tell you some other places this is happening too, which is broadcasting. The systems that actually send out, um, if you have, uh, you're watching a cable channel, I, I know the students don't watch TV anymore, if you're watching YouTube, um, but if you have a TV, there's something on the back end that is collecting the media, that's organizing it, it's putting the headers and banners around it and then playing it out to your satellite channels and your TV channels. Those systems were using proprietary protocols they were air-gapped from corporate networks. And these systems are all, all adopting standard IP protocols now. They're adopting IP because it allows interoperability, it increases the efficiency, uh, and it allows new technology to make its way into this industry. Um, this same thing that's happening is going to create the same risks that we've seen in the industrial control world uh, over the last decade and are continuing to see today. Another place it's happening, healthcare. Um, people in healthcare talk about the connected hospital room. All of the sensors and all of the devices that are now getting connected in a hospital room are now internet connected. They're adopting standard IP protocols. They're getting data that's being pushed back into centralized systems. These are the, this is the same thing that's happening. New systems are getting connected. Researchers are starting to pay attention to these systems. You've started to see vulnerability disclosures about things like um, insulin pumps that actually are connected to humans. And these are things, as they start to get attention of researchers, are going to become less secure and create massive risk for the people who don't pay attention to the security of them. So security research, the progress that we're making in securing these systems is kind of a double-edged sword. You can't, as these things get connected, as researchers pay attention to them, the status quo of ignoring them no longer works. And we need to watch for where this transition is happening across many different industries today. With that, I will uh, open it up for some questions. Anyone? Uh, sure. I have a quick question. So you talked about the average company has 60 security vendors. Uh, in your talk about containers and Docker and microservices, I kind of got the impression uh, you're collecting information on a more and more granular level. So what I see is we're building a bigger and bigger haystack. And what we need to do is find the information that really says, hey, my risk is going up. Do you think we're going in the right direction? And what are the solutions to this enormous haystack we're creating? Yep. Uh, so, the, absolutely, to, to me there is a collection problem you have to solve. So if you lose visibility because of containers, because of new technologies people are adopting, 
you need to get the visibility back. If you don't have the collection, you're going to miss it all. But then you immediately flip to have too much data. And in, this, in, in the commercial security world, people talk about this as a data analytics and a big data issue of how do I sort through all of this information. And the more that you can do in an automa automated programmatic basis, the better you are. But then at some point, then you really need big data analytics to really filter down and sort through. Uh, and so most security companies these days are looking for uh, people like data scientists to figure out how do I sort through this data effectively, because that's not a problem most companies have solved. So this is uh, uh, more of a business question. In the commercial space, do you see it uh, as more feasible to have core security companies or larger IT companies which have a security division and are integrating security with the rest of their products? Yep. Um, and uh, the, the way I would, I, would, I would phrase that is the idea of doing security engineering into the products um, is absolutely the right approach to, for companies to be taking. And so when, we talk to, when I talk to companies, we, they use this concept of try and move left, which is a lot of the problems we try and solve from a security organization or a security team or what the security officer at a large company is trying to solve is an operational security problem. It's I have a bunch of applications. I have different things that have been collected across many different parts of my company. And now I need to secure this environment. But the fundamentals of security, like the fact that our email system on the internet has not been built in a secure way is a fundamental issue that all sorts of security vendors are trying to solve on the back end of the problem when really we need to solve it on the front end of the problem. Secure application development and supply chain security is really all these ideas of the right place to solve it is during the application development cycle before things are getting released and everything that we do on an operational perspective is very often just kind of cleaning up the fact they didn't do it right back then. Is IPv6 part of the problem or does it help? Um, from, a, um, from the systems perspective, which is generally Tripwire is mostly playing within the systems level, so on servers, on network devices versus n monitoring at the network level or looking at security from a whole internet perspective, um, IPv6 has not affected what we do at all. Um, certainly people want IPv6 support, so we want to be able to talk to an IPv6 device or have systems that have IPv6 addresses communicating with each other, but we just haven't seen within large companies the adoption of it or lack of adoption really change much of what we do. So uh, I, you know, I've been in security for 20 years. We've been talking about its impact for 20 years. Practically speaking, at the level of what we do, hasn't changed anything. Hi. So uh, you said the vulnerability research is kind of hurting the security ignorant, right? So as you have more and more of these, um, you know, secure. Uh, uh, connected uh, devices in hospitals, et cetera, and actually on the more individual basis, what is your advice to people who are sort of security ignorant and you have so many categories of security products, so looks like you know these two are kind of you know at loggerheads, more of the vulnerability research, the more the security ignorant are kind of being exposed to the uh, bad guys. Yeah, so what, what, what's my advice? I'll give you the consumer versus the CISO of a large company. Uh, if you're a consumer and you care about security, um, I mean, all, all you can really do is, you know, pat, you know, keep your system up to date, patch, try and keep a good firewall and security for your Wi-Fi at home. Um, I have some of the people at Tripwire, the more paranoid people. Um, they firewall off all traffic. They try not to use smart TVs in their homes. And you probably saw the stuff with like Vizio and Samsung and how people are monitoring your TV viewing. So you can get really paranoid about it. Um, I think some people will be very paranoid. Uh, some people have just given up and say they don't care. Um, you know, container, containerizing and sending boundaries around what you're trying to secure, uh, that's kind of what I do. Like I try and secure the laptop and information there, the rest of my home and like what my kids are doing in our house and what patches they're installing on Minecraft. Um, I just have given up on that. Like yeah, I don't care if they go hack into malware. Now if you're a large enterprise and you're worried about this problem, um, you want to take a framework that you can trust, like the NIST cybersecurity framework, the critical security controls. You want to orient your, your organization around what have we already implemented, what's already working, do some gap analysis of what could we do to improve. And generally, what we've found is the best thing people can do is go back to the controls they already have implemented 
and figure out how to get more value out of those things, um, which is different from the thousand companies who are out there who says you just need one more product. Um, generally, it's about process. Um, we talk, I talk to customers about the combination of people, process, and technology. And if you could just get more effective and mature of what you already have, that's probably the biggest bang for the buck you'll get. At, at, at the risk of oversimplifying, um, in, a, in the process of avoiding chasing the next shiny thing, how do you see the intellectual processes of large enterprises um, finding the methodology, the intellectual tools to be on the front end of that operational design versus the reactive side of integrating the next shiny thing? Yep. Well, most large companies uh, will have their own application development teams uh, and are building their own custom applications to some extent. And so application security has become a very big space and DevOps has really helped people bake security process into what they're building. So things like static and dynamic code analysis tools are really important for them. That integrating to DevOps so that as they roll out things, they're actually checking the security before things move into production. So for instance, what our customers who are using DevOps today, they use deployment tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Vagrant, products like that. And the old way of doing vulnerability assessment was I go to my production systems and once a day, once a week, once a month, I scan them looking for the risks. The new way people are approaching it is I build an application before it gets rolled out, a scan happens as part of the rollout, and then if I find a risk or a major vulnerability, it's not even allowed to move into production. So when you can automate that entire cycle from finding the bugs being written by the software developers to checking it as part of the production rollout, I think you get a more effective overall security program working. And again, it solves some of that problem of just trying to fix it after the fact, which is almost always too late now because uh, the adversaries are moving so quickly. Um, by the time you've moved it to production, they're going to find it almost instantly. Uh, could you comment on the adoption from your commercial clients of uh, looking at DisaSTIGs, uh, the NVD, uh, National Vulnerability Database, MITRE, CVEs? Yep. You know, are, are they looking at it? Are they not? Kind of uh, what size company uh, is, is that transition made? Yep. So um, CVEs, um, heavily, heavily used in the security industry, um, generally for now correlation of vulnerabilities between different products to enable interoperability, uh, and even down to the level of um, you know, finding a vulnerability on a system, then someone else has a threat intelligence feed that's telling you what vulnerabilities are being exploited. So CVE has become the industry standard index for that. Um, in terms of DISA STIGs, clearly in the, in the government space, we've seen a lot of adoption. In the commercial space, the Center for Internet Security benchmarks are what we see as the generally most used standards. Most large organizations have taken the CIS benchmarks and done some level of tailoring it to their gold images or their configuration standards, so they've adopted it. Uh, the problem with most CIS standards is you won't get 100% passing of what the security recommendations are for what people are actually implementing for their servers. So they try and adjust them so they can have a better benchmark against how they want systems configured. Um, did, did I cover? Good. In a general term, are the vulnerabilities you're talking about manufactured vulnerabilities, or are they where somebody has tampered with the software or the programs coming in? Yep. Um, so um, for the most part, when, when we look at vulnerabilities uh, at Tripwire, we're generally talking about software flaws that were introduced in the development of the code or the product that made its way into the production environment. Um, tampering, is it, you know, tampering is definitely an issue people are concerned about, um, but it's not the I guess it's just not the standard industry term for vulnerability people would generally use. So it's not a malicious vulnerability that you're talking about? No, we, we would talk about that more from the intrusion, you know, more from the, the breach or an incident or a, um, an intrusion detection capability in terms of looking for someone doing something malicious to a system. Now it gets tricky because supply chain management has kind of changed that people are very worried about what comes into their organization has been tampered with and you know, that's the whole area of kind of trustworthy computing. Um, but that's a, that's a different area of security than what we generally play in. 
So it wouldn't do enough just to be able to identify whoever touched that coding that you're worried about. Um, there, there, there definitely are people who are concerned about that, that part of the security story. You know, back to how do I know that what was manufactured and the code that was put on a chip is actually what was supposed to be there and when I receive it, it there's a chain of custody that proves that the correct thing. Um, that's very, it's an important area of security. Um, but again, Tripwire mostly plays on this operational security level where I'm trying to manage my broad infrastructure of everything I have, and so it's, it's already been received and in there by the time I'm monitoring it. Makes sense? Thank you very much. Thank you.